What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to the Guitar Corner. I'm gonna play you a song that is in a TV show called Bosch. Um, I'm really lucky. I've got a few hundred songs in film and TV at this point. Uh, this is a little instrumental one, and um, I love Bosch because the lead actor in it's Titus Welliver. He was uh, he played the character Silas Adams in the David Milch show Deadwood. Deadwood is one of my favorite shows ever. We actually named one of our dogs Silas after that show. And I'm a David Milch nerd. I've listened to even his his uh, speeches about writing. At, I think it was UCLA. Boy, if you're a writer, man, check David Milch out. He's on a whole other level. But yeah, I'm a big Titus Welliver fan. So to find out I had a song at Bosch was really cool. Um, it's called Take What You Need. And it goes like this. Big up to Jim Wilcox again for making me this freaking guitar, man. The, the Brent Mason telly. I did an episode a little bit ago about couple things this all these pickup configurations do. I still don't have them learned, but they're really fun. Today, I'm sending this through this uh, Electro Harmonics muff pedal that I used on the metal one here last time, and hopefully we'll get some Billy Gibbons nasty type of sound out of it. Uh, e Blues again, here we go. <laughs> coming out of the amplifiers. So yeah, basically we're just hitting the lows and then answering it up high. E, E, B, B. That way when you move one, the other's still in position and you got the key is make sure something's still ringing when you go to your next E. So I got three E's ringing there. Actually four, because this, this, open the E string, E here, here going, Whoa, I'm trying to find if there's dissonance. So that's what's cool about this again. Makes it kind of nasty. All right, folks, today is not just for guitar players, and hopefully, there's some folks that uh, maybe just musicians or writers or um, people in the business watching some of these because we're trying to get into the old psychological, spiritual side every now and then. I want to talk about something that keeps coming up in my heart and mind lately, and that is keeping this whole thing sacred. I know that the times that I let the business get ahead of the music. Now look, if you're a hobbyist or you're not, you're not trying to get, make a dime in music, I actually envy you because there is something to be said for keeping your joy and your hobby separate from where you make your money. That is a beautiful thing. Um, but for those of us, and, and, you know, and it doesn't even have to just be the music business, anybody in some kind of entrepreneurial place or artistic place, boy, it is important to cut a space for yourself that has nothing to do with any other expectations or anything else. I'm gonna actually shut these off so we can hear one another so you can listen to my craziness and then I can read your comments. Um, there's a few there's a few things I've been thinking. One is, so I do a lot of this music for production music and it's awesome because it gets in all these TV shows. I've been doing it for years. But it's funny when you're looking more at the financial side of this and you know they call them ingestions when they take the CDs in and some of these companies, I mean, they have hundreds of CDs coming in a month. I think Spotify now has 1.6 million artists on it. I heard Stevie Van Zandt say that on Bill Maher the other night. Um, so you got this much music coming through. There's always opportunities, wonderful. But you do start feeling sometimes like it's like widgets. They actually, they call it an ingestion when they bring the music in. That sounds like the big machine eating. And um, I've talked to people about what catalogs are worth and publishing is great because the stock market sees it as a consistent thing. And it's like, man, there's people buying songs that don't even listen to what, what they're buying. Um, we call them catalog investment vehicles. Folks, this stuff, it, it, it's, it's necessary. It's what it is. But if your goal is to try to be writing something and, and, and getting the inside outside and, and, and expressing yourself, be real careful that that stuff doesn't become the focus or become something you're chasing. And I'm not saying this to lecture you. I'm, I'm, I've been in that sea. I've done it. I've been in that place where I'm worried about the business too much. Or I'm not getting up and writing first or reading something beautiful or studying other artists that inspire me or looking at, you know, this, um, this may sound a little bit um, 
you know, hippy dippy, but nature, anything where you feel like, okay, I'm back to a quiet, you know, listen, my own wheels turn a little bit because the problem with all the, the financial side and look, nothing more rock and roll than touring, you know, rock, nothing more capitalist than uh, rock and roll bands. But I think we have to keep cutting the space for ourselves and be real careful that we don't let the market decide. So a couple things I, that really helped me that I've heard on podcasts and, um, and a book that I read lately I want to share with you. Um, the first thing I'll say is, this is from experience. I did three records in 2020 um, called Hymns for Revolution. I did a record called Mayday, The Darkest Hours, and The Most Fire. The last one's very conceptual. Good and Evil is this little girl that plays the part of like trying to, you know, heal, you become ourselves and heal the world. And then I did this me through a pitch shifter as sort of this demonic, you know, evil thing of us, you know, our greed and our um, not caring about one another and all this. And I poured my heart and soul in this, this music. Now, granted, it's very dark. A lot of it's really dark. Of course, we've talked about this before. To me, dark and depressing is actually cathartic. But this one did not find an audience at all. And you can come up with all the reasons why. And, oh, nobody's listening to it on Spotify and this and that. I mean, uh, you know, when Stevie Van Zant saying, uh, you know, nobody, I really didn't find an audience for my solo stuff. I mean, this is Bruce Springsteen's guy forever. The, you know, incredible is uh, in The Sopranos. There's plenty, Lindsey Buckingham just said this on a podcast I heard where he was just like, well, yeah, this, they were, you know, a lot, a lot of people listen to my solo stuff. I haven't, I haven't run into Lindsey Buckingham um, or any of those cats on the road, but if I saw Lindsey Buckingham, I, I would have to contain myself from just grabbing his leg and be I love you, change my life. You know, you really never know how something's affecting somebody and judging it by the numbers is a really, really dangerous way to go. Because first of all, if it affects, what would you rather have? Maybe a few people love it or you, you, know, you have fleeting success where everybody pays attention and nobody uh, you know, has no staying power. Tom York just said on Alec Baldwin's podcast, he said, and this is, I mean, Radiohead. I saw him at the Hollywood Bowl years back. It was like a spiritual experience. OK Computer is probably my favorite, one of my top five favorite records ever. They just used Karma Police and Ted Lasso the other night. And I was like, oh, this song is so good. But he said, when we put out a record these days, Tom York was talking about, I think it was Nokia saying, we need content for our phones, finish the record. <laughs> he said that, he goes, you put out a record and it's like throwing it in a waterfall and it goes down and that's it. It's just so much material. I mean, I used to play that little game where you're like paying for in caps, like Borders and Barnes and Nobles. I did the 30, 30 cities Borders tour, 30 days, 30 cities. Um, and somebody would be excited to pay $16.99 after your performance for a CD. And as the young cats are like, what are you talking about, $16? Uh, now it's $9.99 for all the music ever made on Spotify. Spotify, you got, talk about billions of dollars. And I think a million spins is, is like $4,000. Now that may sound like some money to people, but if you think about what it was to get a dollar a track, look, this is life. The toothpaste out of the tube, it changes. I'm not even whining so much as I'm saying... Making a living in the music business is harder than it's ever been. I'm really lucky because I've been doing it a long time and I'm, I'm diversified. I do a few things and I work night and day. I'm up early. I'm going to bed late. I mean, this is all I think about, all I'm doing. Um, but I think we got to, I think you know, there's going to have to be an adjustment in expectations, but I also think more than anything, we just have to keep some of that stuff at bay and outside the door while we're trying to do our best work. Because if we don't do something, and again, I'm not lecturing. I make this mistake. I start chasing. I'm like, you don't even know it's happening. In your head, you're like, oh, that license last time. I should do something like that. No. If we can keep being ourselves, that's our best chance of finding whatever our, our tribe or, our, or you know, uh, the other ship, the, the ship of like-minded fools. It's going to have to be us being ourselves because um, there's just so much content. I'm not sure. I always talk about the social dilemma. That movie's mind-blowing. I'm not sure our minds were even built to see six, seven billion people's news. And the, usually the worst of it, you know, the news this is not a political rant, but I mean, news is, it's uh, it's not a government thing now. It, it's trying to make money. So it has to get eyeballs. It has to get revenue. It has to, uh, it has to, it's just shock and awe. And, you know, I, I feel a similar thing with music in that people are, there's so much happening in social media that no one really stops. I know we're not going to, people aren't going to listen. There are very few people listen to entire records anymore. I get it. 
It wasn't like going over to your friend's house and going, oh man, this is, I never heard this. I couldn't get a hold of this. And you have this kind of communal experience. Wade Hampton said a great thing. He said, man, having a, a special record back in the day was like getting the golden ticket from uh, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Now they just back the truck up and they dump two million candy bars on you. I almost feel sorry for young people that don't, they don't know what it's like to wait for that one thing and just throw themselves all the way into it. And I'm not saying they don't by any stretch of the imagination, but the amount of things coming at us I feel like we have to we have to slow ourselves down. Um, Naval Ravikant, this philosopher cat, he said the best thing. He said so so much of our existence as human beings was these diseases of scarcity. How do we get medicine? How do we get food? How do we you know if you had any kind of entertainment you know in the Stone Age you're like oh man I drew something on the wall woo now we have diseases of abundance. It's too much sugar. There's too many medicines they advertise it to you with too many side effects. There's too much uh, music and no silence. There's too, there's all these situations where there's, there's too much news. There's, um, so I'm not trying to get my cane out and be like, we've got to slow. I think as artists, if we don't listen to kind of the spinning of our own wheels, if we don't come back to the center, I always see this as like the point in the middle and it goes out from there. Not let's find everything in the world and grab at it and try to make something. Like we have to come back to ourselves. Because if our expectations are only based on how many listeners we have for one project, um, then we're, we're always going to be moving, uh, we're going to be cha making changes that are, we're going to course correct in a way that's not about the, the music or the art or the love of what we're doing. It's, I think it, people will hear that, uh, will hear the fakeness in it. And I've definitely made a lot of mistakes um, in my career, but the, the things that are kind of serving me long-term are usually the things that I had, the, oddly enough, were the most fun to make, were the things that were made quickly, that I was hopefully a little more fearless in what I was trying to do. Um, I don't like to get on too too much longer after 10 you know minutes on these things. So I'm gonna close with a, a really cool little um, Oliver Stone thing I heard. I read this book, Chasing the Light. It was about Stone's kind of heyday in Hollywood. He made a movie that changed my life. It was called Platoon. Uh, if you haven't seen Platoon, folks, absolutely unreal. The character Elias uh, Willem Dafoe is kind of good and open-hearted. And Tom Barron, you talk about the good and evil thing, the same thing. It's more calloused and, uh, you know, narcissistic and all these kind of things. Um, so in that film, they used a song called Adagio for Strings. Samuel Barber was the composer in high school. Big up to Marla Weber from North High School. Um, back in the 90s, um, she had the the, um, the classical band play that. I, to this day, can't hear that song without being like, oh, if you'll excuse me, I have to uh, I have to leave the Chili's and go cry in the van. Um, I think it's just the most beautiful piece of music ever made. But anyway, Stone explains in this book, don't bore us, get to the chorus, get to the point. Uh, a little circuitous today, folks. He said he was making all these films. They were all very dark political, very, you know, trying to, he was really going at some big issues. And when he made Platoon, he figured that, you know, that was going to be it. It was a mess. They were in the jungle, the, you know, financing problems, all the thing any, any filmmaker trying to break is going through a million. I can't, I know how hard it is to make a record. I can't imagine everything that, that, you know, a director goes through. But he said that, you know, even when he was trying to get distribution for it, he figured nobody would watch it. Of course, it came out very slowly a lot of vets saw it, and it was the first film they felt really told the truth of Vietnam and really spoke to what they felt. And it was just stunning and beautiful. But he had these moments of complete self-doubt. And everybody thinks that Oliver Stone is this big filmmaker now, but I mean, when you hear, it's good to read these bios because you really hear everybody's going through what we're going through. You know, what I mean, I, I shouldn't even say that. I'm making a good living in the music business. I'm lucky. But everybody, we all want to be on another level. Seems like very few people are content. And, and it's that desire for so many things that, you know, drives us, so crazy. Here's the advice Stone got, and I hope we'll all listen to this, no matter what kind of music or art or whatever you're making. I think this was the coolest thing. I wrote this in the, the old journal, and I keep it with me. Um, some distributor or producer said to him, he said, look, I know it's not, you know, I think it was saying like, it's not happening yet, but just remember, keep making them. Do not, do not change course. If you know it's true, if you know it's good to you, it's going to be good to somebody else. If what you're doing is honest, there are other people like that, they're going to hear it. What they said to him was, just keep making them. Honestly, do not compromise. Eventually, someone will find them. So I think that's the thing we got to take stock in. Is as long as we know we're, we're really putting our best foot forward and we're trying to make something that, uh, you know, is real to us, we're not chasing. I mean, that's not what, what you know, bringing, that's creative imagination, as Willie Nelson says, you know, bringing something new into the world, man, through the, you know, our little babies, our little songs and riffs and different things. Um, 
That's sacred. That's really, really sacred stuff. So I'll leave you with this, my, my show and tell for the week. My wife got me this thing back in the day. It's my title book. Whenever I read something with a cool title, I don't think I showed you this before, and lines from books that I think are beautiful that I might be able to think about for lyrics, I put them in here. Uh, I'm talking to myself here. I need to spend more time with this and the library um, and a little less time worrying about the business. I say that and it's uh, you know a week in LA uh, doing marketing stuff. But hey, it's all a balance. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, I'm going a little long again today. Leave some comments. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to learn, what you want to talk about. My man, Chief Justice Jason Coker out in uh, San Diego has given me some incredible ideas. So we got some good ones coming up. Um, thanks for joining me. I love you all. Talk to you soon. Bye.